Have you ever wondered what's inside of a kangaroo's pouch? Maybe they're saving some snacks for later. Maybe it's for their house keys. Or perhaps they're used to their part-time job transporting people to work every day. The short answer is kangaroos use the pouch to carry their young, or joey. They need the bag because after a short gestation period of up to 36 days, the joey is born and crawls into the pouch for their continued development, where other mammals would not. Once he is born, it's the size of a jelly bean. Although he is deaf and blind, it has an acute sense of smell and finds its way into the warm and protected pouch. The joey will then attach itself to the mother to drink milk where it receives nutrients and from there it will live, grow and develop for the outside world for the next four to six months. Once the joey develops enough, it can leave the pouch and stretch its legs to adapt to the world outside. But it will still go back to feed inside the pouch for a further six to 12 months. These time frames vary depending on the types of species of kangaroos there are four different types. The red kangaroo, the largest of all the kangaroos and all terrestrial animals in Australia, is found throughout the mainland, though generally in deserts and open grasslands. Nicknamed the Big Red, it can stand as tall as six feet and weigh up to 200 pounds. The eastern grey is mainly typical of the eastern coasts. These are the second largest, with a height of 5 feet tall and a weight of up to 180 pounds. The Antilopine kangaroo, the smallest of the four, is located in the far northern tropical regions. Their height reaches up to 4 feet tall and they can weigh as much as 110 pounds. And lastly, you'll find the western grey in the southwestern and southern areas of the continent weighing up to 120 pounds while standing up to 4 feet tall. Of all the different sizes, their most notable ability is to leap forward in a bouncing motion, covering vast distances. The Big Red can cover up to a staggering 30 feet in just one bounce. Although, what makes the kangaroo so unique isn't uncommon in Australia. They share evolutionary traits with other classifications of macropods. Wallabies, wallaroos, quokkas, and patamelons are distant cousins of the kangaroo, with several species in each classification. They all come in many different sizes and live in the unique areas that they've adapted to throughout Australia and New Guinea. Although marsupials were once more common throughout the rest of the world, it's unclear where they originated. The old fossils of marsupials were found in North America, but it is clear that the marsupials slowly made their way down under and came through South America, across Antarctica, until finally into Australia. Of course, we're keeping in mind that this was when the continents were all still attached. Once making it to Australia, they quickly adapted without competition from the other animals. Some other mammals made it to Australia around the same time. The bat family and the rodent family, it's not surprising that mites and rats had managed to make it to Australia before humans. Although Australia's climate would have been very different from what we know of it today, marsupials had adapted quickly to the changes. There has been some debate about the unique characteristics of the marsupial were better suited for the drastic changes in weather as opposed to other animals. The smaller gestation period allows their young to feed on milk a lot sooner. Marsupial milk has growth and immunity factors greater than other mammals' milk, which could be beneficial in a harsher environment, which is why marsupials are more prominent in Australia. The kangaroo has explicitly adapted over the ages. Their success in adaptation reflects on their current population of around 48 million throughout Australia, easily outnumbering the human population. Although their success is not entirely due to their unique traits, it's mainly due to the lack of predators. The dingo. The mammal migrated to Australia approximately 8,000 years ago, but their numbers are controlled around most of Australia. And then there was also the thylacine, also known as the Tasmanian tiger, which slowly disappeared from the mainland since humans arrived around 50,000 years ago. And it's estimated they disappeared completely around 4,000 years ago, allowing marsupials like the kangaroo to thrive. The fascinating thing about thylacine is that it provides an excellent example of convergent evolution, 
It is the process where animals not closely related independently evolve similar traits. The thylacine and the gray wolf come from entirely different parts of the planet and only share a common ancestor that existed at least 160 million years ago, yet they evolved similarly. Other marsupials fit the category of convergent evolution. The marsupial sugar glider, which is like the placental flying squirrel, the hopping mouse, which is like the North American kangaroo rat. There are types of marsupials and other moles. The Tasmanian devil is like the hyena and wolverine, and the wombat has resemblances to the groundhog and marmot. The possums and their cousin, the opossum in North America, has evolved to have opposable thumbs, a feature found in primates. Hedgehogs and porcupines, mammals completely unrelated to Australia, have their unique spikes but share this similarity with the echidna. The echidna is another mammal altogether and not a marsupial. It is of the monotreme order. The echidna is one of the only two left in the monotreme mammals. Unlike other mammals, monotremes don't produce live young but lay eggs, of which their young, or puggle, hatches just 10 days after being laid. But like all other mammals, the puggle will drink milk from their mother. A further example of convergent evolution is with the koala, which has evolved to have fingerprints like primates. The koala has adapted through the warming of the weather in Australia. As the climate became drier, there was a distinct change in the fauna throughout the continent. Eucalyptus trees became more prominent as they more easily adapted to drier climates. Over 70% of native forestry in Australia is currently eucalyptus. The eucalyptus leaves, or gum leaves, are deficient in nutrition. They are so low in nutritional value that they shouldn't be the main diet. But the koala took advantage of this uncontested food and adapted over time. And now they only eat them, and they'll gorge themselves up to six times per day. It ensures that they need to sleep up to 20 hours each day. But although they sleep a lot, they're very safe high above the eucalyptus trees. The animal world in Australia is strange as it is diverse. But even those natives in this land have their own stories that make them even more bizarre. Indigenous Australians have stories from the dream time, telling tales of weird animals that existed. One mythological animal was the bunyip. It has been told in tales as a beast that lurked within the swamps, rivers, and lakes. Although commonly known as the bunyip, it's also referred by many different names throughout the country. Before Europeans arrived in Australia, there existed around 250 languages within the native population. Each language has a similar story of a beast that lived within the water, which would provide a valuable lesson to young children to be careful around swamps and rivers. The bunyip's various forms, scales, fur, or feathers, sizes as small as a dog and as large as a buffalo. Some are unimaginably strange in appearance, but others weren't too dissimilar to actual animals like the crocodile. A precursor to how mythological creatures like the bunyip were created had likely originated from bones and fossils of existing animals. For example, in Europe, stories about dragons are argued that they probably originated from finding dinosaur fossils. Fossils are the likely foundations for the stories based around the infamous bunyip, animals from the megafauna period, which around 2.5 million years ago saw the largest of them all. This period ended about 20,000 years ago. Variations of the bunyip coincide with animals that once lived during this period. The thylosolio, also known as the marsupial lion, was a large and powerful carnivorous marsupial. The diprotodon, which resembled a giant wombat, weighed around 6,000 pounds and was 10 feet long. A further version was of a beaked bunyip covered in feathers related to the dromornithidae, a bird standing at 10 feet tall. Each of these was from a time when megafauna was more common, and humans lived among them for a short period. Although the age of megafauna in Australia has long passed, there are still animals that adapted to the changes in the drying continent, the new species introduction, and even the involvement of humans. The four kangaroos, the red eastern, the western grey, and the atilopine are still living reminders of the age of megafauna. Why is Australia so strangely empty? Why haven't we discovered so much of the ocean? Is our planet a perfect sphere? 
And was the Earth once more purple than green? I bet you didn't know these facts about our planet. So let's find it all out. Australia is really massive. To make it easy to understand its size, it's nearly as large as the entirety of Europe. Home to around 26 million people, Australia is among the countries with the least population per area. It's ranked only 55th for the highest population in the world, while it has the 6th largest land area. Why is so much of it empty? A good guess would be the many dangerous animals hiding behind every rock. At least this is enough for me to avoid Australia. But there's one specific reason to explain this. The dryness of Australia ensures that 85% of the population lives within 30 miles of the coast, and 80% of them live along the eastern side where rainfall is more common. But although there is an overall lack of rainfall, only 20% of Australia is unlivable desert, and only 40% is considered not habitable by human standards. The water consumption is actually higher than their average rainfall each year. But there is a further ancient water source hidden way below, which can support a much larger population. It's one of the largest underground freshwater resources in the world, the Great Artesian Basin. It covers a staggering 656,000 square miles, which is one-fifth the size of Australia. It holds enough water to cover the Earth under a 1.5 feet deep layer of water. Or, more usefully, it could provide enough water for thirsty Australians over the next 1,500 years. Only 6.5% of Australia has soil suitable for farming, so this doesn't seem like a huge amount. But in case you forgot, Australia is big. And this small percentage is about the size of France. With this massive area available for farming, Australia has more than enough to feed its population with a further 70% of agriculture products that are exported overseas. So, with plenty of land, food, and water, why are the population figures so low? A very slow migration process is the reason. First, only people from the United Kingdom lived there. Then, they opened their borders to other Europeans, and this restriction remained in place until 1973. You would think almost 200 years would be enough time for a lot of people to migrate, but Australia was just so far away. The risk of traveling such a long way and the cost of the journey meant that people from Europe prefer the shorter and cheaper options to migrate elsewhere, like Canada or the USA. For the past 2,000 years, people have understood that Earth is round. But did you know that it's not a perfect sphere? Through the wobbly rotation of Earth, our planet constantly changes its size, very slowly, of course. The North and South Poles are surprisingly flat. Earth is pretty much like a ball being squished. Imagine there's a giant hand with the fingers pressing at both poles. Because of this pressure, the equator pushes a little outwards. Along with an uneven gravitational field, Earth has loads of gravity glitches, some positive and others negative, creating an uneven, rocky and bumpy surface. Some places on Earth have more gravity than others. If you weighed yourself along the equator, you would weigh 0.5% less than at the poles. Not a whole lot and definitely not worth the trip to change your weight. If you were to measure the length from the center of the Earth towards the furthest point of Earth, you would be shocked that Mount Everest isn't at the end of it. Instead, it's along the equator, which is the pushed out part. Ecuador's mountain Chimborazo would actually be the tallest point on Earth, as it's the furthest from the center. We still have around 80% of the ocean to map, which is crazy considering how much of the solar system we've explored in comparison. But we're still aware of many of the unbelievable details about the ocean. It covers over 80% of the world's surface, where 94% of the Earth's wildlife lives. And from some of the life in it, up to 80% of the world's oxygen is produced mainly from plankton, algae, and bacteria. One of the most famous already mapped places is the Mariana Trench. It's the deepest point on Earth, as low as almost 7 miles deep. That's a huge, 5 times the length of the Grand Canyon and deeper than Mount Everest is tall. It's also home to one of the most ancient seabeds on Earth, casually laying low for about 180 million years. 
the pressure at the bottom is over 1,000 bars. But although this is 1,000 times more than normal pressure, life still flourishes here. Throughout the ocean, there is an estimated over 3 million shipwrecks lying in the murky depths. Countless artifacts sit there untouched, and there could be more than all the world's museums. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is the longest in the world, reaching 40,000 miles. That's almost 10 times the size of the Andes, the longest mountain range on land. The sun is the reason behind the blue and aqua colors of the ocean. This color isn't from the reflection of the sky, though they are both blue for the same reason. The surface of our planet receives white light from the sun, and it absorbs the orange, red, and yellow light stronger. It doesn't absorb the blue light so much, so it returns to how we see it. Of course, this only occurs based on how pure the water is. If the water is full of mud or algae, they scatter the light and overpower the water's natural blueness. There are many factors that determine what color we see on our planet. Could you believe that the Earth was green before? Instead, it was purple. Chlorophyll in our atmosphere absorbs mainly blue and red wavelengths from the sun and reflects the green ones to what we see our planet as today. Long ago, ancient microbes called retinol dominated the Earth instead of chlorophyll. They absorbed green light and reflected red and violet light. Those microbes had a simpler structure, so they were easier to produce in the low oxygen environment of the early Earth. They provided our planet with a purplish color instead of green. But chlorophyll is more efficient, and as the Earth was developing, it eventually took over. Imagine that billions of years ago, faraway observers could see our home as a small purple dot. I wonder if we could have also been purple. Probably not. The biggest tree on Earth is a giant sequoia named General Sherman. It stands over 280 feet, almost reaching the height of a 26-story building. They believe it to be 2,700 years old, with a circumference of 1,000 inches. Its weight is a staggering 1,800 tons. That's heavy, but it isn't the heaviest living thing on Earth. In Utah, a huge grove of trees called Pando works like a single colony of trees. The massive root system connects all of them together with up to 47,000 stems. It weighs up to 6,000 tons and is 80,000 years old. It makes it the oldest living thing known to humans. Now, what about the biggest area of one being? Off the coast of Western Australia, a seaweed grows to an unthinkable size. The Poseidon's ribbon weed has been growing for 4,500 years, spreading underground clone shoots. It's all connected and shares the same DNA with most of its shoots. It covers a massive 77 square miles, the same size as 28,000 soccer fields, or the size of Nebraska. And it won't stop there either, as it continues to grow by two feet each year. It's hard to even picture the scale of these enormous beings. Now, just imagine if they were all purple.
Don't even try to escape. Wow. Okay, okay, I got it. Jeez. No need to swing your fists here. These savages can't even eat in peace. 